Assalamu alaikum. So welcome to Quantum Information Science and Technology. Uh, this is a new course that uh, we've developed and uh, the name is slightly unusual because it merges science and technology together. So generally the courses that we deal with focus on one aspect of technology or they just talk about the theory of quantum information sciences uh, in, a, in a course that is generally called quantum information theory. But I think in this course I would like to merge and make a fusion between science and technology because as you know that we are at the cusp of a second quantum revolution. Uh, as far as many historians of science or historians of the human civilization have it. So there was an industrial revolution followed by an information revolution. The first quantum revolution took place at the turn of the 20th century with Max Planck giving his ideas about quantization when he looked at radiation. Now we are entering the second quantum revolution in some manner. Uh, new devices are being made, new paradigms for storing information are being devised, new methods and protocols for transmitting information in a secure manner from one point to another are being developed. Uh, communication is not just on a lab scale, rather this communication between satellites that is taking place, communication between airborne systems, terrestrial systems, satellites, all of them together. So I think, uh, and of course, uh, we cannot forget quantum computing itself, which are information processes that are promising in the sense that they can tackle extremely complex problems that would take forever on a classical computer. This also has implications for how we design drugs, how we create new molecules, uh, how we study molecular interactions, uh, and how we are able to make information more secure. And if you remember, the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics was given to none but three doyens of quantum information science technology who looked at these confounding aspects of quantum entanglement and not just on a theoretical scale but they actually implemented entanglement and demonstrated through their experiments that entanglement not only exists but the kind of new physics that emerges from entanglement also violates some very deep Cartesian concepts uh, of physics and we have to somehow go beyond our notions of local realism. So it's all very exciting. Uh, so this is a preamble to the course. It's uh, going to have some assignments, some homeworks, but they will not be graded. Uh, though we will assess the assignments and provide you with feedback, but these assignments and homeworks will be ungraded. There will be a midterm exam, a final exam, and a project. Okay? And the TA for this course is a very bright individual, uh, a physics student. His name is Abdullah Jha. So Abdullah, can you just stand up and show your face to others, please? So here is Abdullah. Uh, he sits in the Feynman wing on the first floor of the SSC building. Uh, these videos in due course I'm going to also put on YouTube. Uh, I do have some uh, requests to make. One is uh, be punctual, please. Uh, do not miss classes. Uh, be on time. And do not drift in and out of the class just because you have an important phone call or just because you just have a phone call. So try to shut down your communication with the outside world at least for this one hour. And you're happy. You can happily ask questions to me anytime. Uh, we'll have some computational work in this uh, course as well. Uh, there will be some algorithmics, there will be some deep theory, there will be some... Uh, we'll also do a tour of the single photon lab uh, in the Feynman wing. So I hope this is going to be a course that you will enjoy as much as you will learn from. So today, uh, I'm going to start off my discussion with something really simple. Are they? CS1. No, it's not CS1. 
So we're going to start off with the. So I just want to ask uh, before diving into this course, I just want to ask you how many of you have some prior experience in quantum mechanics. So almost all of them. So uh, have you learned quantum mechanics or modern physics? Has everyone studied modern physics? Right, so there's some quantum mechanics in modern physics as well. So I hope you are abreast with that much. You know what the Schrodinger equation is, you know what a quantum state is. Is is that are you comfortable with those ideas? Right. So all the graduate students here, I think they must have learned some quantum mechanics before they are taking this class. So is that correct? Is there anyone who hasn't seen quantum mechanics at all? Right. All right. So can you introduce your background a little bit? I am MS Double E Finance, right? MS so all right. So I hope uh, I'm able to talk some sense. So even if you haven't studied quantum mechanics, you'll have to have some uphill journey. But I think it is achievable. It's it's doable. And there are many excellent tutorials on quantum mechanics out there. You don't have to learn all of quantum mechanics, just the basics. And I think uh, I will cover most of it as we go along in this in this course, right? So has anyone ever taken a course on quantum computing or quantum information sciences, online, remote, physical? Dula, you have, I think. So, quantum information to Course India, all right. All right, so let's get started. <laughs> So the first idea I would like to talk about is the idea of quantum states. And the word quantum, you learn what the word quantum really means. So, but let's start straight off with the idea of quantum states. Now, uh, there are different ways in which we can introduce quantum states. So let me give you a simple example. So something that everyone knows about. So suppose I have a transistor. Say 5 volts. Now this is an NPN transistor. What this transistor does is it acts like a switch. Whenever there is some current coming into this transistor, some I, so you, you must recall that every transistor has a base, it has an emitter and it has a collector. It has two junctions, so it's like an NPN or a PNP transistor. And all transistors act as switches. Now if current comes into this terminal, the base of the transistor, then the transistor is switched on. And when the transistor is switched on, a larger current, i.e., can flow through this path, right? So if you have a heater here, the heater can be switched on if you just put in a tiny bit of current into this terminal, into the base. That's how relays work. So you want to control a big current, but you don't want to have a switch in the large current sector rather you choose to put a small current uh, into a base so that you tingle the transistor and when you tingle the transistor it allows a big current to flow through some other terminal. It's like a valve. Okay? Now when this happens uh, then if you were to put a voltmeter here what would what would you see? If this transistor is off, if the transistor is off, what voltage would you see over here? 5 volts, right? Because 
no current is flowing therefore this voltage must be equal to this voltage so that there is no potential difference and there is no current through this arm mm. so when i is off this voltage let's call this voltage small v is 0 volts and when we just push in a tiny bit of current into the base current flows and suppose oh, there is no resistance over here all the voltage drop must occur across this resistor which means that this is a ground terminal so is this a ground terminal so this voltage would then be equal to zero correct so when a current flows there has to be some drop across this resistor now if we ignore the resistance of this part then all of that voltage drop must occur across this resistor which means that the voltage here would oh this is sorry 5 volts the voltage here is now 0 volts so now this transistor is acting as a switch by putting a small amount of current you can control what this what this voltage is this is how most electronic circuits work conceptually you call this position this configuration uh, a state say let's call this a state and let's label this state as 1 and let's label this state as 0 so just by controlling the amount of current that is going into this transistor we can switch the state of this transistor so this is a very simple example these transistors in real circuits can be very complicated but the idea remains the same the transistor can be switched on or off but it can toggle, toggle between the states which we've called 0 and 1. So now the transistor has a state or the transistor exists in a state in a state 0 or 1. We've labeled one state, one configuration 0, and we've labeled the other configuration 1. Now, this is a purely classical device. These transistors can come, although they can come in very small footprints, but the transistors we deal with in the labs are large macroscopic objects. So this is a classical object. And we can switch or toggle the state of this transistor between 0 and 1, according to our own choice. But this is a classical system, and this state is a classical state. Now, if this were a quantum object, forget about what quantum really means at the moment, but if we were to dig, dive deeper, go smaller and smaller, and come up with a device which is truly quantum mechanical or has exhibits quantum behavior, then we can also come up with ideas that are very analogous to this. All right. Now, suppose this were a quantum transistor. A quantum transistor could also exist in these two states and uh, these states also come with labels 0 and 1. States are just configurations. Now in the quantum world we have the habit of putting these labels. Now 0 doesn't really mean the number 0 and 1 doesn't mean the number 1. Here we have a voltage 5 volts. We call this voltage, label this voltage 5 volts as a state 1. Here we have a voltage of 0 volts roughly and we label this voltage as state one, 0. So these are really labels. These labels define the state. So if you want to ask what's the state of the transistor, you will say it's in state 0 or it's in state 1, depending on whether a current has been injected into the base of this transistor. Now we move to quantum transistors. Quantum transistors can also exist in two states. And here we are talking about a certain paradigm which is called binary logic. Binary logic means that this transistor has just two possible configurations, 0 and 1. There could be more as well. But let's just focus on two configurations. So a quantum transistor, if it were, if it were to obey binary logic, it would also exist in either of these states 0 and 1. 
0 or 1. But the nice pretty thing that we do is that if this were truly quantum and we were living in the quantum world, this transits to a quantum in order to specify the labels and identify that these labels correspond to quantum states, we put them in this notation. This notation is called a ket. Ket. So this is ket 0 and this is ket 1. So a quantum object can exist in a state which is either ket 0 or ket 1. Other authors, other people could come up with different labels. They could call this, call these two states cat alpha and cat beta. Someone would call them as cat zero and cat one. But these are two states that are different from one another. And they are distinguishable. We'll have more to talk about this. So now let me give you some examples of objects which are quantum and can exist in these two distinguishable, mutually distinguishable states. Any questions up to this point? Yes? Sir, how quantum transistors look like it could be tiny? So we are going to talk more about this in a minute. So let me give you some practical examples of this. Suppose I have, what is light? Can anyone tell me what light is? Descriptions of light. What is light? Electromagnetic radiation, so waves that are traveling in space or in a medium, electric fields that are oscillating, right? So that's one description of light. Anything else? Packets. Packets of energy, which are generally called photons. So even if, so there are two views of light. One is that it's a wave, which is called an electromagnetic wave. So if this were a picture of a wave, so at one point in time, I am frozen in time and I, take, I have some camera that can capture electric fields. So I take a picture with my electromagnetic camera. This is distance, this is a spatial axis, space axis, and this is a picture of a wave frozen in time. So there is something that is waving here something undulating, something oscillating. What is this thing? Uh, what is this thing? The amplitude is just how big this is. It's an electric field or a magnetic field. So this is really an electric field here, right? So this is a wave picture of light. Got it? Yes. Wavy picture, wave picture of light. And this is what Newton was dealing with, this is what Fresnel, Haydn, Summerfield, Kirchhoff, all of these people are dealing with waves of this kind. But then there is an alternative view of light, in which, of course this wave has some energy which is proportional to the modulus square and all the usual stuff with it, but then there is an alternative viewpoint of light as well, which is equally strong, equally formidable, and what is that? We mentioned packets of light. Now it's very difficult to draw packets of light, so I will not even attempt doing that. But just for the sake of pedagogy, let me draw this packet here. Don't take this too literally, it's just a, some packet that carries la, uh, energy in it. Let's call this packet a photon. Okay, so that's an alternative view of light. Light is a stream of photons. Light that is coming out from these tube lights streams of photons that are washing around this room, light coming out from a laser, a collimated beam of photons coming out from the laser. And these photons also carry energy. So that's an alternative viewpoint of light. Alright, and both of these pictures are equally valid. There are some experiments that tell us that light is a wave, some experiments that light tell us it's a particle and then there is this famous conflict between waves and particles and the wave-particle duality that you all know so well about. Now we are talking about quantum states. So let's talk about a photon. Now a photon has some energy. If I were 
to take if you have to stand at one point and a wave of light comes through and with time I look at how the electric field changes so here I take a picture frozen in time suppose I don't take a picture frozen in time rather I take a picture at one point at one location and I see how the electric field changes while I stand at that location how does the electric field change with time so here I am drawing how the electric field changes with position I can also if, if it were a traveling wave I can also picture how the electric field changes with time at a fixed position so here in this picture time is fixed right and I have a portrait of the wave in position I can also do the converse thing that I could draw a wave at some fixed location in which x is fixed and this axis now represents time right this is what a traveling wave is you could do look at look at this wave from either perspectives and if you studied wave motion and you know a little bit of physics or maths you would also write an equation for this so for the simple sinusoid I would have something like a cosine kx minus omega t plus some phase right this is what these are two alternative depictions of this equation of this uh, expression so now here is how the wave changes with time so suppose there is a water wave and I am standing at a fixed location and the water wave is passing so I will jump this is what is going to happen right this is a picture of my motion here with time so what is x? what do you mean x is location and this is time now you know that this thing is given a special name it's called the time period and this thing is given a special name if it's a sinusoid this is generally called the wavelength and I take the inverse of this that's called a frequency in space spatial frequency and I take the inverse of this this is called time frequency or just the frequency 1 over time period is just the frequency f correct now this was Einstein's and Planck's genius that they said that if there is a frequency f associated with the wave then this packet will carry some energy which is HF so that's the energy of a photon now let's move on so now we want to come to quantum states if you look at this description here is this a traveling wave is this a traveling wave is this, is this wave moving in time Yes, sir. so if I change the time here and if I were to draw the picture again and again and again at one time this is what the picture looks like at another time if I were to take another picture at some later time this wave will have advanced ahead right at even some later time this wave is going to move further ahead so I just change the value of this time and if this axis were my position axis this x I will get a wave that is advancing in time position, of position in space position of photon. no there is no this is a wave picture not a photon picture at the moment I don't understand what is, what is the exactly the thing you call the position of this so suppose you have a rope and the rope is tied to the other end and you wiggle the rope so then there is a wave along the rope so the length along the rope is this x so this wave is moving somewhere in space if it's light it's moving in space or in a medium in air this is the position in air position in which the wave is traveling <coughs> now if 
if this is my electromagnetic wave and the wave is traveling from left to right this is the electric field is this the only manner in which the electric field can orient itself what other directions can the electric field point in uh, this is upward and downward so suppose i am a wave electromagnetic wave and my hands motion is showing the electric field so now i'm moving from left to right the wave is propagating from left to right and my hands motion is showing the electric field right so let's let's move with the wave up down up down up down up down up down right so this is the electric field vector that is oscillating up and down let's move back up down right so my electric field is in a vertical plane got it but that's there's nothing special about vertical i could also have this configuration the electric field could be horizontal correct this is also a legitimate traveling wave for light but i could also have it at any angle right i could have it at 45 degrees in the xy plane i could also have circular right so this my finger is showing the tip of the electric field and the locus that it makes as it moves along becomes a spiral i could also have instead of going like this i could have something of this kind so my electric field can point in different directions all right so one possibility is that the electric field is vertical and i call this state cat zero if i treat light as a quantum particle as a photon so all the properties that this wave has this photon also possesses this is just a different picture of light a photon can be vertically polarized which means that the electric field can be pointing in a vertical plane but the photon can also have is polarization pointing in the horizontal plane and i could so i could say i can use a labeling scheme in which a horizontally polarized photon is just a packet of light is given the label say i could do anything i could call this cat 0 or cat 1 and a vertically polarized photon cat 1 right i can use any labels that my little heart desires one po vertical polarization i can call cat 0 one i could call cat 1 i can use any labels that i like i can call this there would be some people who would prefer calling this cat h some people would prefer calling this cat b so now if i really have a photon just one photon somehow i have a laser suppose i have a 1 milliwatt laser so the power of my laser is 1 milliwatt and the frequency is say 500 nanometers of light that is coming out from the laser yellowish i would know what the energy of a single photon is that would be hf i can count the number of photons that are coming out from the laser with this power right this would be the number of photons now h is a really small number if you don't remember h is something like 6.63 into 10 to the power minus 34 joules second it's a really small number so if you put in the numbers this n becomes a really really large number billions and billions of photons are coming out from a laser of this small power 1 milliwatt but if i somehow 
I were able to reduce the intensity of this laser so that only one photon comes out at a time. Just one photon at a time. One photon comes out, one comes out, one comes out, one comes out. So then that single photon becomes a quantum object. That's an example of one quantum object. That's a physical example of a quantum object. Now that quantum object will have a certain polarization. And it can have two distinguishable polarizations. Now I'll make this word distinguishable more quantitative as the course progresses. But these are two, I would say, you, you must have come across this word. These are two orthogonal states. And I'll explain what orthogonality means. But these are two orthogonal states. If a state, if a photon is horizontally polarized, it cannot be vertically polarized. There is no character of verticality in a horizontal photon. No character of uh, horizontality in a vertical photon. They are mutually distinguishable, orthogonal states. So now we have the photon, if you look at the polarization of a photon, it can exist in a quantum state, ket 0 or ket 1. That, so the polarization of a photon is one example of a quantum state. And the photon is like a quantum particle and you're looking at its polarization property. Okay? You can also look at other properties of the photon. You have a question. So how the case of single photon is different from beam of photons? Like you said, for a single photon it becomes a quantum object. For beam of photons, is it also the same? So, the statistics come out to be totally different. So this is a subject in quantum optics. If you just have single photons, they show quantum behavior. The statistics are different. They are, the light becomes anti-bunched. The statistics become sub-Poissonian. So it gives you totally different behavior than a bunch of photons. Okay, the statistics are different. You can squeeze those states and so on. So that's where the you enter the quantum reality. So remember, uh, if I were to, some people ask what is the difference between classical and quantum. Is the world that we live in, is it classical or is it quantum? Classical. Classical. So really if I were to make a Venn diagram, so which, word, which one is inside? Is it classical inside or classical outside? Classical inside. Classical outside? Classical inside. 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 So actually it's classical inside as far as I can tell. The world is really quantum. Individual particles, they are quantum. But we don't see quantum behavior in our daily lives because we are big. And we are hot. Which means we are warm. Quantum behavior is generally manifest when we go to the really small world. And when we go to the size of mic microscopic or subatomic particles like atoms, electrons, molecules. And if you have a lot of a large number, a soup of quantum particles, their average behavior looks to us as classical. Because we evolve as biological species. When we evolve, we didn't need quantum mechanics because we were big. If we were the if we were the size of a virus, the size of a small bacterium, then probably our sensory mechanism would be quantum, but really we are classical objects. The average length of a human being might be a meter or a meter and a half. You weigh about 50 to 100 kilograms in adulthood and so on. So we are big objects and we live at room temperature. We live at room temperature, many of these quantum effects are washed away. They are averaged out. So classical behavior is really averaged quantum behavior in one sense. So if you look at your computers, Computers also work on electrons and transistors of this kind, but there are many of them. There are millions of electrons that turn on a transistor or thousands of electrons these days that turn on a transistor. But if there were just one electron turning on a transistor, then the quantum properties would manifest themselves. 
So the world is really quantum mechanical, or it's, but when we look at average quantum behavior, it turns out to look like classical. And that's the world that we are used to be li living in. I answered your question? Yes, sir. Thank Anyone you. else? Akos Walka. All right, so basically, we've looked at one property, one example of a quantum state, the polarization of a photon. Let's look at another, any other example that you can come up with of a quantum object for which we can define these. So here is one property of a photon. So we know that the polarization of a photon is one example of a quantum state. Another example, also with a photon. Suppose I have Now, I, I deal a lot with photons in my lab as well, so many examples that I will give are from light. Suppose I have a device which is called a beam splitter. What a beam splitter does is when light shines on it, what, what does a mirror do by the way? A mirror reflects. A perfect ideal mirror reflects all of the light that falls on it. But a beam splitter is in between. It reflects half of the light and transmits the other half. So if I have a beam of light coming in, so many photons coming in, in this direction, If this were a 50-50 beam splitter, like a fair coin, there's 50% chance of getting a head or 50% chance of getting a tail, 50-50, then half of this intensity would transmit and half of this would be reflected. Well, now if I were to repeat this experiment, instead of a, a large tube of photons, of millions of photons, just I just want to repeat this experiment one photon coming in now don't ask me how do you generate these single photons one obvious way is that you have laser light and you attenuate it to so big a degree that only one photon is allowed to go so the efficiency of transmission is really really small from a medium but there are other clever ways of doing this as well but suppose you have a single photon coming in on the same beam splitter So just now, I will resort to my cartoonic caricature. So just one single photon coming in. What's going to happen to this photon? Will it transmit or will it reflect? Right. So there is some probability that it will transmit and some probability that it will reflect. Now this is the first time I'm using this word probability. There is some probability that it transmits and that probability if this were a 50-50 beam spirit is one half and there is some probability that it reflects. Again this probability is one half. But now instead of looking at the polarization of a photon, here we, not, we don't care about the polarization of photon. We look at another property of the photon that is whether it is reflected or it is transmitted. That's another property of the photon, right? That's another, physicists like to use fancy words for simple things. So they call it the degree of freedom. So that's another degree of freedom that we're looking at for the photon. Here, the degree of freedom is the path of the photon. And there are two possibilities, distinguishable possibilities. One is transmission, the other is reflection. So let's call this transmission ket zero, and let's call this ket one. The single photon comes in, the single photon will also have some state, but forget about that for a minute. And it takes, comes out from the beam splitter from two possible ports, two possible exit routes. And we call one exit route cat 0 and the other exit route cat 1. So now instead of the polarization of a photon, we have the path of a photon as our relevant degree of freedom. This is being treated like a quantum object 
and it can exist in either of these states, get 0 and get 1. Okay, so now we have looked at two examples of quantum states, both to do with photons. So let's look at another example. Now let's move away a little bit from photons. I would now like to push one. Okay. Right. So now let's look at the spin of electron. Spin of electron. Now, electron. So this is the first use of the word electron in this course. Electron, a single electron, it has mass, it has some charge. So it has some degree of freedom, mass is a degree of freedom, charge is a degree of freedom. Uh, another property an electron has is its spin. Now spin doesn't really mean that the electron is spinning, right? That spin is just a word, in want of a better word, this is what the original originators of this idea, Good Smith and others came up with. It's a quantum mechanical property. What this means, so in order to understand the spin of an electron, that's very important to understand. The first one lecture is really important because it just sets the stage. You know what a magnet is? Right, so magnet need not be charged, but a magnet has, does it, a magnet have a direction? Does it have some directionality associated with it? Yes, it does because Generally in your school you study that it has a south pole and a north pole. So it must have some axis associated with the magnet. Some vector associated with the magnet. Polar vector. So because it has a south pole and a north pole. And from your basic physics, I hope you don't forget your freshman physics. You can show a magnet by an arrow. Generally called a dipole a magnetic dipole. What's an electric dipole? A positive and a negative charge separated out. You can have a single electric charge but you cannot have a single magnetic monopole as far as we can tell in 2022, 2023. So this a magnet is a magnetic dipole and if you want to think of this and you want to connect this to your basic knowledge South Pole and a North Pole, but I don't like these terms very much because they're very non-physical, very childish in a sense. Anyway, a magnet, a tiny, an electron is also a magnet. It's a tiny, tiny magnet. It's a tiny, 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 tiny magnetic moment. It's the smallest magnetic moment that can ever be. Okay, it's called, and its value of the magnetic moment of electron is called the Bohr magneton. That's like the unit of magnetism. Just like the charge on an electron is the smallest charge that you can ever get. And everything could be multiples or fractional multiples of the charge of an electron. If you talk about quarks as well. Anyway, so a spin is something, an electron is spin which mean, it means that it acts like a magnet. For all practical purposes it acts like a magnet. And if you pass these electrons through a magnetic field, an inhomogeneous magnetic field, they will, depending upon their orientation. So magnet can point up and it can point down. Right. Now let's look at this concept. So now I'm being slightly literal here but don't take me for granted I'm drawing an electron here right but don't read into this too much this is just for pedagogical purposes if I were to put this electron in a magnetic field which is pointing out oh sorry did I say electric field magnetic field if I were to put this electron in a magnetic field have you ever come across magnetic fields? Yeah. Example? The magnetic field of a coil magnet. Of a coil magnet or a okay. disc magnet or even the earth. Yes, sir. The earth is a magnetic field. 
So if you put an electron in the Earth's magnetic field or any magnetic field, and all the field lines are pointing in the same direction, so it's a uniform field, then this electron, since it's, it's a magnet, it can have two configurations. What's the uh, lowest energy configuration? So if I were to draw an arrow showing this magnetic dipole associated with an electron, what's the lowest energy configuration? What what direction would this electron like to align itself in? This direction is parallel, right? So its magnetic dipole moment would like to point up. So this dipole moment, let's denote this by its proper symbol mu. It's a vector. This is our magnetic field, let's call this B, magnetic field. Now this is one configuration of the spin of an electron. Let's call this configuration get 0. Another possibility is that the electron can choose to be naughty, can choose not to obey the rules and some radiation that passes it twists its magnetism, it twists its magnetic moment and decides to take, to point in the opposite direction. This is also one configuration of the spin of an electron. Let's call this state cat 1. So now we have the spin of an electron which is our quantum degree of freedom, our quantum object that we are looking at is an electron and the property of the electron or the degree of freedom that is our, of our interest is the spin of an electron and it exists in these two quantum states cat 0 or cat 1. Of course they will have different energies, this is lower energy, this is higher energy from basic electromagnetism you know that if you have a magnetic moment mu placed inside a magnetic field B. This is what the energy turns out to be. This is the energy of a magnetic dipole inside a magnetic field. If these are parallel, this energy is lower. If these are anti-parallel, the energy goes up. But nevertheless, these two states exist. These are distinguishable states, orthogonal states. And these are the two quantum states of a particle. The particle which is the electron and we have said therefore that the spin on electron is also a quantum object and we can identify its two states. So all of this is looking like Boolean logic. Do you know what Boolean logic is? Just like computers, if you computer science students you all know that all our computers work on zeros and ones. This is a register, a register has bits, a byte has eight bits each bit is either in state 0 or in state 1. Those bits are really transistors or flip-flops or some kind of electronic devices, memory elements. And they exist either in 0 or 1. So if I have <coughs> a register, so a little bit of CS, a little bit of computer science here. So we have 8 bits. This is a register with 8 bits being charged. It's called a byte. 8 by 8 binary digits. 8 bits. Now, <coughs> you can have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. So you can have some value stored in here and each one of these bits could be in state 0 or 1. Now if this were a quantum register, say you had 8 photons somehow or 8 electrons or 8 ions in a trap, in a, in a linear arrangement which is called an ion trap, you are looking at the spin of the ions then you could have a quantum register in which if I were to do, do an analogous, so this is the state of this byte in Boolean logic. Come across this word Boolean? Boolean logic, this is Boolean logic, base 2 logic. 
because there are two possibilities, zeros and ones. So if this were a quantum register, I'm going to draw it a bit bigger, with eight units. Now each of these units could be in a certain quantum state, could be cat zero, cat zero, cat one, cat one, cat zero, cat one, cat one, cat zero. This is a quantum register. Okay? This could be eight electrons standing in a nice linear fashion. Somehow you have control those electrons to stand nicely, they don't interact much with one another, they stand in a, in a nice orderly fashion. Or ions or molecules or photons, somehow there are eight, eight of these. And each one of them exists in a certain state. So this is the quantum state of this quantum register. Take a minute. Okay? Now it happens that each one of these things here is now a quantum bit. Instead of a bit, it's a quantum bit. And what I would like to do, I'm like of playing, I, I'm fond of playing with semantics, so I take this cube and I take this bit and I make this into a qubit. Okay? So a qubit is a two-level quantum system in which we can define two states cat 0 and cat 1 <coughs> and it can take different manifestations different physical forms could be the path of a photon in the beam slitter experiment it could be the polarization of a photon it could be the spin of an electron the spin of a proton it, it could be the direction of the current in a squid it could be anything Right? Uh, different physical manifestations are possible, but the language, the mathematical language, is generic. Okay, so I'll come. What if we add cat zero and cat one? Uh, will we reach to zero? Cat zero? No, I'll talk about this. Moment. Any more questions? Yes. So, but you can always initialize. You initialize a, an algorithm or you initialize a register to start off in a certain state. You can always create a photon in a state cat 0. You can always create states. Yes? Sir, can quantum states be a zero being a kid who do we can take a shot of cat 0 cat 1 for the cat 2 3 for the possibility? Yeah. Because they're cutrates. Cutrates. Higher dimensional views. The simplest is qubit, a two level quantum system is the simplest. But there are higher degrees as well. You can have three states, other states, and we say that the Hilbert space expands. So you can have higher dimensional systems as well. Three level states are called qubits, four level states are called qubits, and so on. N levels of state, not, not confined to just two. All right, any more questions? Sir, like in computer, can the qubits be used only? No, no. You can have higher dimensional quantum computers as well. These are simplest to understand. Now, let's uh, move a little bit ahead. A little bit forward. Okay. Now, I would like to start straight away with uh, something which is quite strange. And that is the idea of a superposition. So generally, when we're dealing with quantum states, we use this symbol psi, psi, the green letter psi. Of course, it's a quantum state, so we put this in a ket, ket, ket psi. So the ket shows that we're talking about quantum states here and quantum objects. Right? So this notation ket and bra and ket, I'll talk about bras later, but the bras and the kets, they are due to 
an engineer and a physicist called Paul, whose name was Paul Dirac. Dirac. So this is called Dirac's cap notation. Dirac's bra and cat notation. And what this notation does, it really simplifies your calculation. It simplifies, and there's some notation that actually tell you about the physics as well. So this is a kind of notation that is not just a notation, it goes beyond that. It has intellectual power in it as well. You can do many calculations with the bracket notation and open up new vistas of thinking, new ideas about thinking as well. So it's a very powerful notation, it's really simple. It just has the bra and the cat and probably another kind of expectation value kind of thing. That's it, very powerful. So generally quantum states are denoted by the symbol psi. So, so psi could be ket 0 or ket 1 for a qubit. Okay? Two level quantum system. Now the idea of superposition is strange. In Boolean logic, in your normal computers, if you look at the first example that I gave, transistor example, the transistorized bit here, either current is coming in or it's not. So either the state is 0 or 1. So 0 and 1 are mutually exclusive. They cannot coexist. Either your transistor is on or your transistor is off. Right. So this is quite understandable. So if, if I were to look at the classical world, I mean, it's impossible. So I can either stand on the floor or I can stand on the chair. Right? So one is cat, one is state zero, the other is an excited state cat, oh sorry, not cat, one. But I can't hang in between. Right? It's impossible to hang in between. So there's a mutual exclusion between zero and one. But that's not true for the quantum world. The power of quantum mechanics is that quantum objects, qubits, can exist in a superposition. Okay? Now what this means is that the quantum state need not be either ket 0 or ket 1. It could really be some superposition of zeros and one, cat zero and cat one. Where C1, C0 and C1, these are numbers, some numbers. And to add more excitement to the mix, these numbers can be complex numbers. So it becomes really exciting in one statement. First of all, we said that if you can have a superposition. A quantum object, a qubit, can exist in a superposition of 0 and 1. At the same time, in, in one go, it will be, and with each of these states, you can have a coefficient. In that coefficient, certain properties. It can be a complex number. I hope all of you are aware of complex numbers. It can be complex numbers. And there are some additional properties as well which these numbers must have. And that have to do with probability but I'll talk more about it. So in general a quantum state or a qubit can the most general way in which you can write a qubit is C0 cat 0 plus C0 C1 cat 1 where these two are complex numbers all right examples let's look at examples so is it for one electron it's one quantum object yeah one qubit yes Fir hum dekhte hain ki kis tarah hum observe kare wo collapse ho jata hai fir superposition goes away 
in most cases. We'll talk about measurement and probabilities. All right. So <coughs> this is our quadrant. Let me give you an example. <coughs> so one example is C naught is one, C one is zero. So this is your state, right? Another example is C one is one, C naught is zero. This is your state. But there are more interesting examples as well. Suppose. C naught is one over under root two, and C one is one over under root two. Then my quantum state is going to be cat zero over under root two plus cat one over under root two. This is an example of a superposition. Another example is my C naught is one over n root three, and my C one is two over n root three e i pi by three. This is a complex number, and so is this a complex number? So my quantum state with these coefficients becomes one over under root three cat zero plus two over three under root e i pi by three cat one. Right. So this is my quantum state now. This is an example of superposition. Now, what does this all, all of this mean? Okay. At least I, I've made a postulate. I've, I've given you some examples of superpositions. So let's see. Let's see what all of this means. And I will turn back to the example of a of a photon. And the example that I'm turning to is this one, the path of a photon. Now I want to describe what what this bizarre business of complex coefficients means in the superposition world. Okay. Yeah. So can we directly add k zero and k one without c one and c zero? Well, you can, but you. There are other constraints on these coefficients, which I'm going to explain now. Now, what? यहाँ तक कुछ समझ समझ आई बात की, ठीक है? अब I'm going to make sense of that. What What does that mean? And the example, physical example that I I have chosen to describe this process is this experiment, the path of a photon. So I put in photons. सिंगल फोटॉन्स वन बाय वन एक के बाद दूसरा एक के बाद दूसरा ऑन अ बीम स्पिडर परफेक्ट बीम स्पिडर एंड लुक एट वेयर द फोटॉन इज रियली गोइंग सो लेट्स ड्रॉ दिस कॉन्सेप्चुअल थॉट एक्सपेरिमेंट व्हिच कैन इज नो लॉन्गर अ थॉट एक्सपेरिमेंट इट कैन एक्चुअली बी डन इन द लैब सो दिस इज माय बीम स्पिडर And a photon, a single photon comes in, and I have two possible paths. One path is cat zero, the other path is cat one. These are the two output states. And this is one photon coming in. Now what I do is I want to do an experiment. I want to measure. First time I'm using this word, so every word in quantum mechanics in this lecture probably will have a certain. It's charged with emotion because every word is not just a word; it really has a word of meaning in it. There's a lot of philosophy associated with quant this quantum business as well. The word that I'm going to use here is measurement. Measurement makes life interesting, doesn't it? So we don't measure all of this. 
don't observe all of this. You might say that this is just like eating a Harry Potter novel or it's just like uh, Sinbad's travels and with no physical significance. But we want to measure all of this. So what we do is we put a detector here. This is a kind of detector. What the detector does when a photon comes and strikes this detector, it gives a click. Click. Okay. Let's call this detector B naught because this is in the path of cat zero. And now let's also put a detector here. This is the symbol I'm going to use for detectors generally. Let's call this detector D1. Okay, and both of these are special detectors which have the property that they are only triggerable, clickable by a single photon. They can look at a single photon. So these are single photon detectors. And these detectors can be found, they can be made. Right? These are common these days. So just like imagine your eye. Is your eye a single photon detector? It cannot detect that dim light. It is generally triggered by 40, 50 photons. So it's pretty good. But if you want to image uh, an, a nebula in the outer dark space, you want a detector that can only click or detect, pick up a single photon that is coming from that dark nebula. Right? Some animals who live inside the dark abysses of the ocean, like eels or they might have eyes or retinas that can pick up single photons. So these detectors can be made by the way. So now we have the single photon avalanche photo detectors D0 and D1. Now what's going to happen is there's some probability that the photon goes here and some probability that the photon goes here. If this were a 50-50 beam spitter, then uh, then uh, half of the photons, half of the time the photon will go here with probability one half and the probability of this detector clicking will be one half. Now what we would like to do is, is the following. In, now this is a uh, perfect beam spreader so the probability that detector D naught clicks is one half right and the probability that D1 clicks is one half. Now suppose we uh, do the following experiment. We have a beam speeder here. And another beam speeder here. Uh, Here we have another device that is called a mirror. So I have this kind of arrangement. Let me finish this. So we have two beam splitters. So these white bars represent beam splitters. And these pink lines with this dashed corrugation represents a perfect mirror. So whenever a photon strikes on it, it is always reflected. All right. Now what I would like to do is, suppose a photon comes in. So it has 50% chance that is transmitted. Let me this over. I'm sorry. Okay. Now suppose it has 
So there's 50 percent chance that it is transmitted and a 50 percent chance that it is reflected. Now this mirror always reflects the photon that comes on, on it. And this mirror always reflects the photon that comes on it. So let me read on this. And here we have another BS mirror. Now so suppose I put these two detectors over here. D naught. And I call this path cat zero. And I call this path cat one and I put a detector here. D one. This is path one, cat one. Now this is an experimental arrangement. It's called an interferometer. The special kind of interferometer is called a Mach Zender interferometer. Do you understand the arrangement here? Two beam spirits, 50-50, and two perfect mirrors. Now I'll give you two or three minutes to think about this, and I want to ask you what is the probability that D naught kicks and what is the probability that D1 kicks? Just from common sense, I mean, don't worry about any quantum details here. What do you think is likely to happen if this is a 50-50 beam splitter and this is a 50-50 beam splitter? One by two again. Right. Got it? Q? Q? So each beam splitter is giving a 50% probability of reflecting the photon and a 50% probability of transmitting the photon. So suppose it is, suppose a photon comes in, let me retrace a photon, one possibility. A photon comes in, it's reflected. Suppose it's reflected. Here it's always reflected. Now you're back here. It can either be reflected or uh, so the photon is comes in. Suppose it's reflected from this beam shader. It's always reflected here. Here again, it can either be transmitted or reflected. So there's a half probability of getting here and a half probability of getting here. Suppose the photon takes the other route. So instead of being reflected here, it's transmitted here. So it's transmitted, it's reflected from this mirror. Here again, the 50% probability that it's trans reflected and a 50% probability that it's reflected. So here there is a probability of one half that the photon can take this route or this route. Here there is a probability that the photon can take this route or this route. So the probabilities add up in the manner that this, this root has a probability 1 by 4. This root has a probability 1 by 4. So the two 1 by 4s add to give a probability of 1 half here. And this root, so the photon taking this exit root can be through two possibilities. It can either be reflected here and transmitted here or it can be transmitted here and reflected here. So again, there's a one quarter probability that it will take either of these routes. Those two one quarters will add to give you one half here. Got it? But this is not what actually happens in the lab. Actually, what happens is somewhat totally counterintuitive. Only one of the detector clicks. All right, and now we have to describe why this happens. So, is the classical picture clear? You have a random object here, which is like 
something that has a 50-50 probability here and this has a 50-50 probability of directing the photon to either of these parts. Now if you combine these two random objects together, you will still get something random. A 50% probability that D0 clicks and a 50% probability that D1 clicks. But in reality, this does not happen. Only one of the detected clicks. This is just like interference. A certain possibility destructively interferes and becomes impossible. And another possibility constructively interferes and becomes possible and highly likely. And the only way in which you can describe that is through superposition. I'm going to take this concept further in the next class. Uh, and I'm going to invoke the idea of a superposition by telling you that a superposition exists over here. And then we're going to take this example further. But before we finish off, are there any questions you would like to ask? Yes. So what stage did you start with uh, in the survey? So I started off with a photon coming here. Uh, was it a I could also have started off with a photon coming here. Uh, sir, did you quantum nature was it a superposition or was it a pure state? It's a pure state. Get zero. Let's call it get zero. So this input port has two possibilities as well, get zero and get one. But I start off with get zero. I could also have inputted a photon on the other input port. This beam splitter, this experiment has two <coughs> input ports and two output ports. I'm just choosing one of the input ports. Any more question, G? Yeah. So it's at 45 degrees. So the angle of incidence must equal the angle of reflection kind of thing. Alright, so I'll also announce my office hours. Uh,